Y'all still fellowshiping out there. I like that. I like it. I like it. Hey, if this is your first time or maybe you haven't been in a while, i just uh, let you know my name is Pastor Adam. I'm senior pastor here at Connect Church. And um, if you have been coming uh, for the last five weeks, you have not seen me on this stage. I got a little break. Thank you for giving me a break. Um, pastor Mike, I just want to say thank you. You did a phenomenal job uh, going through Colossians. Like, it's, it's great as a, as a pastor when you have other people on staff that are, are so good. And then sometimes it's like, ooh, like, he's really good. You know what I mean? Like, uh, hopefully I can, I can come back and everybody love me, you know? Not, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, no, he did. He did a phenomenal job. And uh, I love um, that for him going through that. Thank you, Pastor Mike, for that. Um, and if this is your first time and you are looking, traveling around, man, just like kind of church hopping a little bit, trying to find a, a place, we just want to say welcome home. Amen. Yeah, like, like we just, we will love on you. We will pray for you if you do have prayer needs. So this is something I want to say and uh, just so I don't forget it. But if you have a prayer need in your life, during this next, we'll have 21 days of prayer that's going to start um, Actually, tomorrow morning, it starts this morning, but tomorrow morning, 6 a.m., we're going we're gonna to start having prayer. But if you have a prayer need in your life that you would like for us to pray over during this 21 days, please fill out one of these red cards at the back. Put it in the, uh, the little red box there, and we'll get those. And then who's ever at prayer, like you do not have to put your name on it if it's something sensitive or whatever, but we will pray over that for the next 21 days. And watch God do something big. Come on, y'all. We'll watch God uh, answer your prayers and come through like he said he would. Amen? Amen, amen. So I'm just going to jump right in this morning, uh, and we'll have some more announcements at the end of service. But uh, we are starting a new series today called Stewarding the Vision. Now, that word stewarding is something really in, in the Christian world. I probably hear it more in church than I do outside of, the Christ, of, of, of church. You know, it's not just a word like we just use every day. You know, like you tell your kids, hey, go steward. You know, be a good steward of your room. You know what I mean? Be a good steward of your homework. You know what I mean? That's not just something like we just use every day. You know what I mean? So it's a word that, that really is, uh, it's in the Bible. Come on, y'all. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. I want to talk about what the word is, what it means. You know, if I was to ask, and I'll just ask this morning. Like, we'll get a little crowd participation this morning. Come on, y'all. Like, like if, if I was to ask you in one word or just a, a short phrase, what does stewarding or being a steward, what does that mean? To you, no wrong answers. Do not act like they. Hey, I don't want to. You know, all of our teachers will be like, "Well, let me tell you, like we got the definition out." No, so I understand that. But <laughs> I love our teachers, man. We got some amazing teachers in this place. So, what does that word, in one word or a short phrase, what does it mean to you? Take care of, study. Hang on, y'all gonna have to slow down real quick. Like I, I can't keep up with everything. Who's over here? Serving. What was it? Guide. Guide. That's a good one. Managing. Oh, here we go. We got some financial people in the house. That's what I like to hear. I like it. Managing assets. I like that. So, you know, just like if you were to ask somebody, like just if somebody said, hey, just close your eyes and I just want you to picture the perfect sunset. You know what I mean? Like, like what does that perfect sunset look like? Like, everybody in this room would paint a different picture. True? Come on now. Like, mine is on the beach, watching it go down with the waters, kind of crashing in the back. You know I mean? Come on, y'all. Like, or, I'm, I'm going to be honest, like, I got a couple of them, you know, because I'm from Arkansas, right? I mean, y'all know that. We got to love the, the mountains and the trees, right? But watching the sunset through the mountains, man, it's just amazing. So in, in defining something, it's very easy for us to all define it differently. So when we, we come to God and we come to his word, it's something we need to define through his word, amen? Amen. 
So that's what we're going to do this morning, is we're going to define this through God's Word. So we're going to be in 1 Corinthians this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. And uh, we're going to kind of start, we're going to read one verse, and then we're going to kind of define the word stewarding. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, it says this. Let a man so consider us as servants and stewards of the mysteries of God. So in this, in, in, to give you how my brain works a little bit, so I'm like, all right, so, so maybe people don't understand what stewarding means, right? So let's just define it. Let's just go to Webster. And let's just see what, what Mr. the Merriam-Webster Dictionary has to say about stewarding, right? So it's not up there. So, uh, sorry. So, <laughs> so stewardship, we got it. Oh, they're going to put it up there as I read it. I like that. Thank you, guys. I thought I was going to have a whole, a whole page up there. So stewardship, the definition out of Webster is the conducting, the supervising, or the managing of something. And I like this next little phrase in that. Y'all pay attention to this. Especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. So managing something that has been entrusted to you is being a steward, is being, is, is, is being a good steward. So then, then that was stewardship. So then we go to steward in the Webster, and it says this, and I love this because it gives us one more word. Like everything, like I don't know about you guys, but when I want to know something, like I love the addition of all the words. So steward, so steward in the Webster says this, one who actively directs affairs, a manager. So if you are a steward, according to the world, according to Webster, then you are actively doing something. You're actively managing the affairs of someone. So we could just say a steward, according to the world, is a manager, right? Like we got any managers in here? You manage something at work. You manage a restaurant. You manage your, your over a group of people. That's what being a good steward is. So in doing that, of course, now we got to go and say, okay, so in 1 Corinthians there, right, it had the word servant, it had the word steward, right? So there's a book called the Strong's Concordance. And the Strong's Concordance, what it does is it takes the original language. So the Old Testament, just to give you guys just a little bit of history, the Old Testament was written in two different languages. It was written in Aramaic, and it was also written in Hebrew. So then when we got to the New Testament, it was written in Greek. So I don't know about you guys, but I can't read any of those. Like I can barely pronounce English, much less try to pronounce or read another language. And for those of you that, can, that are, are, are bilingual or even however many languages, like I was talking to somebody the other day, he was like, oh, yeah, man, that person knows like this, 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 and like nine, nine languages. I'm like, dude, that's awesome. I got English. Barely. <laughs> I made a C in it, you know what I mean? But anyway, so the Strong's Concordance, what it does, it takes it from the original language because how many know that words in other languages mean something different than we know? So it takes that. So if you're ever looking in the, in the Bible and you're like, man, I wish I knew what it meant in the original language that, the, that it was written in, get you a Strong's Concordance or just look it up online. You can get it off, off you just Google Strong's Concordance and you'll be able to look it up online. So in doing this and defining this, I was like, well, hey, let's go to the Strong's, right? So I'm gonna, I want to pop it all up there. Do we have it all on one screen? So just put everything up there real quick. Just go to all of them because I want you to see. That's not what I wanted. But anyway, so it's the Strong's Concordance of 3623. And I'm not even going to attempt that O-I-K-O-N-O-M-O-S. Okan almost with hey something like that and if you're a Bible scholar I'm sorry you know what I mean like I I sorry that I I did not uh, so the original word did we get did we get the original spelling of that up there did we get all of that no okay so sorry I had that in mind as as all the original because yeah you look at it and you're like wow that's pretty cool um, so but the definition of this word okay. Uh, yeah, whatever it is, I can't say it fast, I have to slow down, was this. It's to manage 
or the manager of a household. So again, it's a manager, right? But it's a manager of a household. And then how it's used in 1 Corinthians right here is the usage of it is a household manager, steward, or it adds one more word, guardian. So we've got somebody that carefully takes care of affairs, someone that is actively taking care of affairs, but also guarding something. So it kind of broadens the definition of what a steward actually is. So can I tell you this? The steward, to steward the vision of God, we must carefully, responsibly, and actively manage and guard the vision entrusted to our care by God. God has entrusted us with his vision. He's entrusted us with the gospel. And we, in order for us to be a steward, we have to actively be doing something. Come on, y'all. Actively be managing something. Not just like, you know, you, you, put, you put some stocks in the, in the stock market, right, and you just let it do its thing. Like, we're not talking about that. We're talking about us actively participating in the gospel. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians, and we're going we're gonna to read a little bit more here. So back in 1 Corinthians, we're going to go back to the, uh, the verse 1. Let's look at that again. It says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So I want you to notice something in this verse. We're servants and we're stewards. Like they're two separate things. So if you're serving, awesome, but what are you doing to steward the vision of God? We're serving Christ in capacities and we're stewarding the vision. You are called to serve, but you are also called to steward the gospel. You are called to carefully manage God's affairs here on earth. When he left, he said, now listen, you guys be stewards of my gospel, of the good news. That's what I need you to do here on earth. I need people to understand, but you've got to tell them about it. To be a good steward, we have to actively be involved. So, in studying through the Word, I always like to go back and, like, like this verse, we're, we're, we're focused in on verse 1, right, of chapter 4, right? But how did we get to chapter 4, right? Chapter 3, I know, haha. Okay, so, I get that. So, we get to chapter 4 through chapter 3. So, something you need to realize about the New Testament is a lot, all of these books are letters, like Paul is sitting down and he is dictating this letter and it's being written. And so they didn't say, he didn't go like, all right, so uh, Timothy, so uh, chapter one, verse one, I want you to say. And then verse two, and then verse three, no, no, no. It was just a flowing letter. No verses, no chapters. And because paper was a commodity back then, like everything was squished together. So it was just, it was just line after line after line after line. Complete line, uh, edge to edge. And so in doing that, in order to really understand what is he saying in verse, in verse 1 of chapter 4, let's go back to chapter 3 to the end of it. So the end of chapter 3, I'm going to start in verse 18. It says this, Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you, you may not become wise, so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolish in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future. All are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is of God. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. So what's he saying uh, before this verse? Is he saying, listen, you look to man, I look to God. You represent what man does, and you worship humans who have money, who have fame, but that's not what I do. I serve Christ. 
and I steward his gospel. So let's, let's continue there. I wanna, so I want to read a little bit after that verse because the next verse is really powerful. It says, moreover, verse 2 of chapter 4, it says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human courts. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who justifies me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and reveal the counsel of the heart. Then each one praises will come from God. So Paul's just basically saying, listen, you worship man, I worship God. You serve man, I serve God. And I don't care about being judged by the world because I'm going to be judged by God. So in, in reading through this, I want you to get a concept of what Paul was talking about. Because he's writing to the Corinth church, right? And so do we have that map? Can we throw that map up there? So this is, you can see down here in, in, in here where Corinth is, and Athens and Greece is over here on this side. So about 40 miles away in this little area, Corinth was actually a port. So it had two harbors. It was so large. It had a harbor on the east side and a harbor on the west side. And so in this town that Paul is writing to, to this church, um, it's a very wealthy town. There are ships coming in and ships leaving all day long. The town itself at this time that Paul wrote to it was about 400,000 people. So for that day, a fairly large city that sat on a coast, had two harbors, very wealthy. Um, so it also had a very large following of a god named Aphrodite. Aphrodite was the god of love, and they had temples for her in Corinth. And in those temples were prostitutes. So to the point, like there were so many prostitutes and so much sin in Corinth at the time that there were people, even um, some of the scholars of that day, would refer to prostitutes as Corinthians. That's how bad the city was. So this church, and here's something, I want, here's something I want you guys to know. The church that Paul's writing to in Corinth at this time of its life was somewhere between 50 to 150 people. So it was about the size of our church right here. And Paul's writing a letter to them because they're in a city that's very worldly. They're in a city that's very wealthy. Sailors coming in and out all of the time. Things happening in the city all the time that shouldn't happen. And Paul's trying to encourage this church of 50 to 150 people. They're trying to, and, and some people actually say that it's only, they were only about 40. So it just depends on where you study and how, but everybody agrees that they were not over 150 people at this time. So this small church in a town of 400,000, so three times the size of Abilene, Paul's writing to this little church and telling them, listen, your city and the way that you've grown up is to look to men. He says, but I need you to stop looking to men in their ways because those are foolish ways. I need you to look to what God's doing at this time. So listen, what Paul was saying was this. To be Christ-centered stewards, we must do things differently than the world does them. Like you can't be a Christian and follow and do things the way the world does them. Do you guys realize that? Like if you're still living the way you were before Christ, something's wrong. We don't want to hear that. Like that's like stepping on toes, but that's the truth, y'all. Let me give you a little example. So in Psalms chapter 15, verse 4, this is one of my, I hope you guys as parents, my encouragement to you as parents, 
is to have some life scriptures that you teach your kids. And this is one of the life scriptures that I teach my kids. I've got about four of them that I, I make sure, like I drill them into my kids. This is one of them. Because in Psalms chapter 15, verse 4, it says this. But he honors, talking about God, God honors those who fear the Lord. He keep, This is talking about the person. It says, he keeps his word even to his own disadvantage and does not change it for his own benefits. In other words, he keeps it. Another translation said, he keeps his word even to his own harm. Like as a Christian, when we tell somebody something, we keep our word even to our own harm. You know, I own a a, a cabinet shop. My son runs it. And uh, so I work for my son now. Uh, Thank you, parents. That's, you know, one day you're going to flip that around and work for your own kids. Um, But in in working in the cabinet shop, you know, there are times when, and I can remember a very specific time, um, you know, we bid cabinet jobs. So we take footage and we take what kind you want, race panel, flat panel, uh, shaker, whatever it is, all different types. We take that information and we take uh, different footages. So you have the kitchen footage, right? You've got an island in the kitchen. Then how many bathrooms do you have with vanities and and head knockers and everything that you have in, in the cabinet shop, right? So we take all of that footage. We put it all down, and then we bid the job off of that. So this was several years back before we were even in Abilene. Um, I bid this job, and it wasn't a really big job. But I bid this job, and I sent the bid out. And then after I sent the bid out, it was a few days later, it was almost like I had this epiphany. You know what I mean? You ever just like wake up at 4 a.m. and be like, oh, ha, thank you, Jesus. You know what I mean? You actually quieted your mind down long enough that you got to hear something. But I had this epiphany. I left a line out. So I had sent a bid out to a person. And I left a line out of that for the footage of cabinets. And it cost me $1,000. As a man of my word, I couldn't go back and say, hey, so sorry about this. Like I left this bid out. And I left this line out, and it's, it's actually going to be an extra $1,000 than what I told you. I can't do that. Because I've already gave them, gave them the bid. I already measured the job. All the cabinets were there. I just left a line out when I was adding things up. So you know what I did? I kept my word. Even to my own harm. Because that $1,000 was about all of our profit on that. Because like I said, it wasn't a big job at all. And so in doing that, I kept my word. So I teach my kids, listen, when you give your word, when you say something as a Christian, it means something. I feel like in today's world as Christians, when we say something, it's just taken as the wind. Like, oh, it could come or it could go. And I think that's why so many people that try to find a church or try to do something, they get hurt by something or, or something happens and they just don't come back because it's just, I don't, you know what? But as Christians, when we give our word into something, when we say something, we need to do that. We need to make sure that we are accountable to ourselves and to God. The world doesn't do that. The world doesn't stay accountable to themselves. Oh, I know I told you that, but you know what? It's really going to be this. Oh, I know that, you know what? I said I would come help you or whatever, but man, I can't now. Something else came up. But that's not what God says that we should be doing as stewards. It says that I should keep my word even to my own harm. The word to what I've said that I will do. So going back to 1 Corinthians, I want to go back and I want to, I want to look at verse 2 there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Because verse 1 is talking about being a steward, right? It says that we are servants and we are stewards. And then verse 2 gives us a requirement. Like, this is a requirement of being a steward. If you want to, listen to me, if you want to be a good steward... Of what God's given you, he said, I got a requirement for you. 
just like you tell your kids, you want to eat dinner, you better clean your room, right? Come on, y'all. And then how many of y'all give in? Like you, uh, you let them eat without clean. Uh-huh, yeah. Okay, we're going to move on. So, verse 2 says this. It says, moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Like you cannot be a steward and not be faithful. And so in that, so I went, I went to my strongs. Come on, y'all. Like, like, is there a broader definition of the word faithful? Because again, we can all paint our own picture, right? So here it is in, in, in Strong's 4103. Um, here's what it says that the, the word faithful in this is. The definition is faithful. Oh, huh, here we go. Great. Let's define faithful with faithful, right? So the definition is faithful, reliable, and then it gives you how it's used. And here's how it's used in that verse. Trustworthy, faithful, and believing. So Paul's saying, Paul says, to be a steward, you must be faithful, reliable, trustworthy, and believing. So I want to go back to the original statement that we started out with. The original statement that we said was to steward the vision of God, we must carefully and responsibly manage, guard the vision entrusted to us, right? So the vision of Connect Church, our vision statement, if you go to our website, bam, here it is. If you're new here and you want to know the vision statement, I'm going to give it to you. So we have four parts in our vision of this church. Number one is we want people to know God. Like at the very essence and core of who somebody is, we want them to know God. And we want them to understand that God just doesn't want to know you like he wants to intimately know you. Like he wants to know you on a deep level. I feel like sometimes we, we, we don't tell God things because we act like he didn't know anything. Like he knows everything about your life. But he wants you to come to him and intimately know him. So we want people, number one, to know God. Number two, we want people to find freedom. Can I tell you that, that in your relationship with God, there are things that you need to get out of your life. There are things that are hindering you from going deeper with God. You know, if, if you look over at the, the parable of the four soils, you know, you have the, the pathway, the one that the seed doesn't even go in. But the, number, the second one was the rocky soil in that, in that parable of the, of the sower. And that rocky soil says that, that, the, that the roots tried to go deep, but because of the rocks, they couldn't go any deeper. And so when the sun came out and it scorched them, it just withered up because it couldn't draw nutrients because it couldn't go deep enough. Can I tell you that in your life, you have rocks in your life. And you need to get those rocks out of your life so that your roots can go deeper. So that you can draw something from God that you need to draw from him. But you have something hindering that. And so in our vision, we want to help you find freedom in your life. The third part of our, our vision statement is we want you to find your purpose. Like what is your purpose in life? What has God placed inside of you to do? What is that one thing that you can do that nobody else can? And then number four is the, man, that's, that's the easy part. Once you've gone through one through three, man, just go make a difference. Like, we just want to give you a place to go make a difference. So in the vision of Connect Church and in doing this and, and help you guys, if, if this is your church, you are helping to steward the vision. You are actively participating in carrying, in guarding, in taking the gospel to the world. You are stewards of the vision of this house. So I want to ask you something because we just, we just read four things to which faithful means. It means faithful, reliable, trustworthy, and believing. So I want to ask you this morning, are you faithful to God? Like we're talking about stewarding the vision, right? We're talking about a vision from God, not just, not just the vision of this church, 100%, absolutely, but the vision that God has for this world and for you. And in stewarding that, 
Are you faithful to God? And I'll even add to that. Are you faithful to God and the place he has planted you? Like this is the local churches, every local church that exists that preaches the gospel, that preaches Jesus Christ, is God's house. According to Malachi chapter 3, God calls the local church his house. So are we faithful to the vision that where God has planted us in the house? Number two, are you reliable to God and to the house? Like, our, like if, if God asks you to do something, like, hey, some of y'all are going to go out to eat today, right? You're going to go. You've already, you already know where you're heading um, for lunch today. And uh, you're going to go out, and, and you're going to sit down. And a waitress is going to come up, and she's having a bad day. And God's going to ask you, hey, I just need you to tell her that I love her. And leave her a little extra tip. My question is, are we reliable enough to God that when he asks us to do that, that we do that? Instantly. Are you trustworthy to God? You know, when, when God gives you a vision... You know, he gave us the vision for this church. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. When he's given us that vision and you're part of this house, are you trustworthy? Like if, 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 if you're on the schedule to work, to serve at church, are you there? Are you there when they ask you to be there? Are you there on time? To do that like are you trustworthy can God like trust you with things like I know and 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 you know for me when I was early 20s 21 22 um actually probably 1920s when God really started talking to me about tithing because I didn't know about tithing I had no clue what tithing was and I and and I was at a place in my life that I didn't have anything couldn't even provide food for my family it's like God there's got to be more and he said there is more but you're going to have to start tithing. What the heck is tithing, God? So I had to go to the Word of God before I even went to Bible college. I had to go to the Word of God, and I had to start looking up what the heck is tithing. What, what does that mean? You know, God says that if you're faithful with the little things, he'll give you much. If you give, it'll be given to you. See, it's different than what the world says. You remember what we, what, what we just read, right? Like the, the things of God are different than the things of the world. Like the world says, get all you can, can all you get, and sit on your can. You know what I mean? Like it says, don't give it away. But God says, in order to get, I need you to give. Like I got a principle that I need you to understand. Like it doesn't make sense when a 19-year-old has absolutely no money and God says, I need you to start tithing and giving so I can get you something else. Because it's a principle that God set in motion that he's never stopped. It didn't make sense to me. But when I started being trustworthy with what was God's, and I started doing that, God brought me out of poverty. Actually, I was living under poverty. Like, you know, the, the bottom of the barrel, I was the one under that. You know what I mean? And God said, I got more for you, but I need you to be trustworthy with what I've given you. And then number four is, do you believe what God says? Do you believe what God says? Like, do you believe this word? Do you believe that if you find something in this word, if you go and you read Malachi chapter, sorry, I about lost my cards, right? If you go and you read Malachi chapter 3 and it tells, and, and it says, hey, I need you to bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and test me or prove me in this, God says, and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you that you cannot even contain. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he'll do what he said he'll do? So I got a couple statements here that I want to I want to say because here's the truth of the thing. You cannot be faithful to God or you can you cannot be faithful to God and not be faithful to his house his local church. You cannot be reliable to God and not be reliable to his house. 
And you cannot be trustworthy to God and not be trustworthy in his house. Like he set things in order. He set things to happen a certain way. And for us to be stewards of the gospel, we got to be reliable, trustworthy. We got to be accountable for things. We got to believe what God says. And we've got to actively be doing something to steward his gospel. So I'd mentioned earlier about our 21 days of prayer that we have. And we've got this coming up. And so starting in the morning at 6 a.m., we're going to pray Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Or 7 p.m. Ah, sorry. 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Sorry, we ain't going to pray. Y'all got to work. We all got to work. From 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. Like we start right at 6 and we end right at 7. So if you, if you need to go to work and you're like, all right, as long as I'm gone by 7, then we are out the door at 7. And we're going to have that over at the MAC, over at the First Methodist Church, which, by the way, this just hit me today. Pastor Mike said something today that just, like, hit me really hard because um, after this service right here, we have three weeks of being in this building, then we move to that building. Like, just moving right across the railroad tracks. And uh, we're going to have signage out. We're going to have, so, when, so that Sunday morning that we're, the first Sunday morning that we're there, you're going to know it. And, uh, and so, man, so we are excited about that. But in that is we're going to have our 21 days of prayer over there, praying over that building. And so from today, today is actually the start of it. Sundays we just have our regular service for the 21 days of prayer. Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then Saturdays we do 9 a.m. to 10. So we get they let you sleep a couple more hours before we have the prayer uh, that morning. But I'm excited about this, guys. Like this is this is a huge step. We're we're throwing um, we're putting a lot of money into some different things in that building because we don't want to uh, lose what we've already got. And so we're putting some money in lights and some different things. So as you're giving to the building fund, we're actually able to, to redo some stuff over there so that we can uh, have church the way that we do church. So, um, and in amongst that, for the 21 days of prayer, we have, um, we don't usually do fasting during the, the August one, we usually do our fast during, because we have it twice a year. We have it in January and we have it in August. But I'm going to ask if you're hooked up with this church, this is your home, this is where you, you call home, this is where you want to be. Um, I'm going to ask that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday that you fast with us. Just the first three days. So if you have medical issues or things like that, make sure you talk to your doctor or whatever before you do that. But we're going to fast three days and here's here's after that third day um on thursday um i'm just gonna i'm, I'm kind of just saying whatever you feel like god has for you if, if you if you feel like you need to continue the fast continue the fast if you feel like maybe you're just like adding one meal and having one meal a day then just add one meal so we're kind of after that first three days we're going to kind of let you determine what you feel like god wants you to do and wants you to fast but fasting is no food guys no food. That, like, that's what I'm asking. And that's, again, wherever you're at, you need to determine that. And so um, we're going to be completely fasting. We'll do water only, Pastor Fair and I, uh, during this three days and, and maybe longer. I don't know, just whatever God says. But I know God's pushing us into something new. Amen? Like, like this move and this going to a campus that is dedicated to God and getting to be semi-permanent. Like the kids area will have walls, y'all. Come on, somebody. Like, like we put up curtains and play panels to keep them corralled, you know what I mean? And then you got teachers running after them, you know what I mean? They got walls, they can close the door. Yes. Y'all don't understand how excited the teachers are. So we actually get some dedicated rooms in that building for, for our kids um, then we have the gymnasium, which is going to be a little different than what we have. Um, but like I said, it's, it's a God thing. And I'm excited about this move and what God's doing. Um, so I've got one other announcement before we move anymore. Um, so we're making a, a couple of staff additions um, 
to what we're doing. And so one of the things, I'm not, I'm not gonna have her come up, but Miss Amanda, will you raise your hand over there? Like, hey. Yeah, so Miss Amanda over here, stand up. Nobody saw you. Everybody over here is like, who is Amanda? Like what? So this is Amanda. <laughs> so Amanda has taken over our small groups. So she's gonna be the small group director. So we have, I think, six weeks before our small groups start back up for the fall. And so if you would like to start a small group, be a part of a small group, find a small group, you know, just whatever, um, go talk to Miss Amanda and we're going to start getting all that organized for the fall um, uh, small groups that we're going to have. And they'll run from mid-September through the beginning of December um, for this fall. And so one of the things that, you know, we talked about freedom, getting freedom, and one of those small groups that we have is actually a freedom class. And so it's an amazing class. I know several of y'all have taken it there in here. Um, and it's something that you could take over and over, amen? So um, I want to bring somebody else up because we have another addition to the staff that we're adding. And so, Roger, if you'll come up this morning. Um, come on up. You going to grab it? Okay. So, Roger, a lot of y'all know Roger. Uh, Crystal, his wife's up here playing the piano this morning. Man, they are just... Man, they're just amazing in what they do. And so Roger has been in the ministry for many years. Uh, he's done a whole lot of things. He's actually helped plant a church. He's uh, been a campus pastor and a lot of different things. And God called him and Crystal to be part of our church. Um, and we're, we're so thankful for that. So something that, that we are adding to the mix is we're adding an executive pastor. So Pastor Mike is our associate pastor, but Roger is going to take on an executive role, meaning he's going to, a lot of the finances that, that the church goes through, he's also going to be doing any assimilation. Assimilation is just simply getting connected with the church. And so, man, I am excited and I'm so thankful that you and Crystal are here. And I, Crystal, will you come up? Like, I want to pray over you guys this morning. Y'all come on. You good? <laughs> so if you guys would, if y'all would just stretch your hands, I just want to pray over them as they come in and be a part um, of the church in specific roles. So, Father, I just thank you this morning. I thank you for what you're doing through these lives. Father, I thank you for where we're going as a church. Lord, I thank you for Roger and for Crystal and for the things that you've put in their hearts. I thank you that we're going deeper with you, Father. Lord, I pray protection over their lives as they step into a ministry role, Father, that the blood of Jesus covers them and their family and their property from top to bottom, that Satan, you cannot and will not affect anything to do in their lives, that they will walk and talk Jesus their whole life. Father, I thank you for what you're bringing them in to do. I thank you for wisdom and knowledge in the areas. I thank you for wisdom and knowledge to take us deeper as a church and to help us go deeper. So, Father, thank you for the anointing that you're placing on both of them for worship and for a pastor, Father. Lord, you're truly an amazing God, and I thank you for them. And I thank you for where we're going as a church. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.